We now understand what mass wasting is and how mass wasting events might be triggered. In the last video clip, we discussed four common triggers of mass wasting events. Now let's look at how we classify or name mass wasting events. Commonly, people may just use a general term like landslides, but there is an easy and very precise naming system. We use two criteria to classify mass wasting events. First, the type of material that's involved, like rock or earth or mud or debris. Then next, the type of motion. If it's a free fall, we call it a fall. If the material moves along a surface, we call it a slide. And surfaces can include bedding planes, joints, faults, and other surfaces. A flow means the material is moving as like a fluid, and creep is a very slow and gradual movement that doesn't fit into the other three categories. Thus, to name an event, simply take the type of material and combine it with the motion. If a rock falls, it's called a rock fall. If rock slides, it's called a rock slide. If mud flows, it's called a mud flow. You get the idea. It's pretty easy. Next, we're going to look a little more closely at some of the different specific types of mass wasting. We're going to briefly address different types of falls, slides, flows, and creep. Falls are the simplest and fastest of the different types of mass wasting. In falls, generally the material will be a rock so they're called rock falls. Check out the photo here. Here's a rock, and it fell, a rock fall. What do you think the trigger for this event was? Water, oversteepening, removal of vegetation, earthquakes? I'm not exactly sure for this particular event, but you could probably argue any of those four. Check out this photo on the right. The Rock falls here have created a big pile of talus, called a talus cone or a talus slope. What might have loosened these rocks before they fell? Frost wedging, perhaps? Slides occur when material slips along a surface. Rock slides and landslides are also very fast events. Slides are often triggered by water, due to excessive rainfall, or by earthquakes, or even by oversteepening, if a stream is cutting through the material at the base, or if it's in a coastal area and waves are cutting through the material at the base. One of the most famous landslides in history in the United States is the Gros Ventre slide that occurred in 1925 in Montana. The slide was triggered by intense rains, so water, and the fact that the Gros Ventre River had cut through the sandstone layer all the way to the clay layer here. So there was no solid connection of sandstone any longer across the valley. Thus the wet, heavy sandstone sat directly on slippery clay. And on June 23, 1925, 50 million cubic yards of material slid down the valley and up 300 feet up the opposite slope, damming the river and creating a lake. Rock slides are also common in places like Yosemite and elsewhere in the Sierra. It's hard not to imagine these exfoliation sheets sometimes breaking loose and going sliding right down the surface. You can Google some pretty spectacular rock slides in and around Yosemite. Slumps are a specific type of slide where there is no distinct flat surface for the slide. There's no bedding plane or fault or joint for which the slide to occur upon. Rather, the material creates its own curved surface as it breaks. Notably, the slumping material rotates along the curved surface. Slumps are very common, especially in clay-rich, thick soils, and they commonly are triggered by oversteepening and or by water during heavy rains. You can see them along the hillsides along Highway 280 and even more are seen along Highway 101 in Sonoma County. Here's a famous coastal slump 
that occurred in, in California along the coastline. We don't really see the side view from over here, but if we did, it'd be a curved surface. The oversteepening in this case was caused by wave action. So slumps are quite common in these coastal areas, reminding us that perhaps roads and houses shouldn't be built right along the coastline. Flows, as the name suggests, occur when the moving material behaves like a viscous fluid. The two main types of flows are earth flows and mud flows, and they're quite different. Mud flows are also commonly called debris flows, as the fast-moving mud generally picks up trees and rocks and other debris as it moves. Again, although they, these both have fluid motion, earth flows and mud flows are very different, and we're going to see that over the next few slides. Earth flows occur along hillsides and are essentially slow oozes that occur after heavy rains. Earth flows often involve materials rich in clay and silt that can hold a lot of water, and eventually they become so waterlogged that the material just oozes down the hillside. Again, earth flows are generally quite slow. Here's a picture of a cartoon picture of an earth flow at the base of a slump. And here's a very similar real life picture of an earth flow. In contrast, mud flows and debris flows can be very fast and destructive. As their name implies, they consist of soil and lots and lots of water. And they generally travel down stream channels, though they may overtop the stream banks. So this is different than earth flows, which just are oozing down the side of a hillside slowly. Mud flows travel fast down stream channels. Where do mud flows and debris flows occur? Well, sometimes they occur in streams radiating out from a volcano. When a volcano eruption melts a mountain glacier, the ash and water mix to form a volcanic mud flow called a lahar. In general, though, mud flows most often occur in arid regions that get sudden intense rainfall. There's no vegetation in these areas to help hold the soil, and flash flows create mud flows and debris flows. Let's check out some photos. Here's a photo of a local mud flow that occurred after heavy rains up in northern Sonoma County, up by Guerneville. Even more disastrous is a mud flow, or more, rather, a debris flow, as you can see here, that resulted from Hurricane Mitch in 1998. You can really see here why the term debris flow is appropriate. There's cement and wood and trucks and trees. All sorts of things were carried by the flow. Similarly, in Venezuela in 1999, there were hundreds of debris flows following very heavy rains. In this particular city, 19,000 people were killed, and there was over $2 billion in damages. Check out the size of the boulders that were moved by this flow while it was occurring. We mentioned that volcanic mud flows are called lahars. The lahars that followed the 1980 Mount St. Helens eruption picked up houses, destroyed roadways, and took out bridges. Notably, you can have a lahar even without a major eruption. Hot gases or unseasonably warm rains can melt glacial ice on top of volcanoes and massive volumes of water may be released, mixing with the ash present on the volcano's flanks. Indeed, the risk of lahars makes Mount Rainier the most dangerous volcano in North America. Mount Rainier is dangerous not because it erupts often, it doesn't, but because of its location right outside the Seattle-Tacoma urban area, and because of the possibility of a lahar. Check out this map. All the green areas represent geologically recent mud flows. 5,600 years may seem like a long time to us, but it's a mere instant geologically. There are many communities in this greater Seattle-Tacoma area that are built on these old mud flows. It happened once, it could happen again. Indeed, several of the geologically historic mud flows occurred even without a volcanic eruption. These communities, hopefully, are lahar ready with evacuation routes and warning systems. But the speed of these flows allows for little warning, especially if it occurs in the middle of the night. 
Tragically, there was not enough warning for the city of Armero in Colombia. A map similar to the map shown here was published just months before the eruption of the volcano Nevado del, Nevado del Ruiz. This map shows areas that were at risk of lava flows, pyroclastic flows, and mud flows. Very few people saw this map or took any notice of this report. And when Nevado del Ruiz erupted on November 13, 1985, the summit glacier melted and mud flows stormed down the volcano stream valleys in the middle of the night. About 30 miles away, the city of Armero was buried in mud and over 23,000 people died. They were buried in mud from the Lahar. At the other end of the spectrum from mud and debris flows is soil creep. This very slow and gradual movement occurs so slowly that it is impossible to even see the movement. Rather, it is detected only by noting changes that appear over years or decades. Indicators of soil creep include leaning fences, broken or bulging retaining walls, curved tree trunks, etc. 